live from the Julia Morgan Ballroom in San Francisco. Extracting the signal from the noise, it's The Cube, covering Structure 2015. Now your host, George Gilbert. And we're back. This is George Gilbert. We're at Structure 2015, and we have a very special guest, Stacy Higginbotham, who, um, along with a very select few colleagues, powered the rise of GigaOM and also the Structure series of conferences. And she's here to tell us um, what she's seen today and how it's changed over time. Well, welcome, Stacy. Thank you, George. Um, yes, I had the privilege of being at the inaugural, I guess this is the second inaugural structure conference, yeah, yeah. but at the initial structure conference all the way back in 20, oh, 2008 yeah. it was, and that was a much smaller event, and I remember being there on a panel with VJ Gill, who has moved around so much, but we were talking about, my God, what is a PAS, um, and at the time I had no idea, um, so it was a perfect panel for me to moderate, and Back then, we were like, oh my gosh, what is this cloud thing? Amazon had launched AWS two years ago. We were still like, at the, we, we couldn't even sell this event. And now we're, it's huge. And we, we didn't know, you know, were we gonna move to the public cloud? And the consensus was no one's gonna put any workloads in the cloud if they're a real legit business. From today where we've got Disney putting things in the cloud. We've got you know the federal government having things in the cloud, but there's actually kind of been this pushback where people are like, okay, we accept that there's the cloud, but now we're like going to build our own kind of thing and we're going to take some of the lessons of the cloud with DevOps and the agility that kind of the cloud offers and we're going to bring it back home. So there's a lot more kind of talk about what we've learned and taking it, you know. On-prem. So, yeah, let's d dive into that a little bit because, you know, for the longest time we were told virtualization, you know, carving up these underutilized servers was going to sort of give everyone the benefits of the public cloud and, you know, the lower CapEx, but the operational processes that made um, the public cloud so efficient didn't quite migrate to the private cloud. We're when did we first start s seeing that, and when did we become aware that that was a challenge? Uh, I think some companies are actually still dealing with that. Um, even today, we had someone from GE, and he was talking about the cloud really isn't about OpEx for us. It's, it's about agility. And I was kind of shocked to see that, because that felt like something that we had been talking about four or five years ago. So four or five years ago. Um, so I was like, oh. Um, meanwhile, we still have like, you know, Facebook and Google and these hyperscale guys, and, and and they feel like they're moving. You know, they're talking about microservices and and you know, utilization rates that are far above and away like what any of these private cloud guys could even be achieving right now. And they're like, I never want anyone to think about a VM anymore. You know, I just want to let people you know push services live no matter what. Well, this is uh, an interesting comment. Do you think that? You know, there's, there's been a law of sort of legacy systems that's held for like six decades, which is they run, you don't touch them. Could we see that sort of all new greenfield apps get built on this new hardware infrastructure with, this new, uh, with these new software processes, and we sort of ring fence the legacy systems? Is that a... I think so. So one of the things, I talked with Diane Bryant yesterday morning, and one of the things I thought was great about her talk was she, she spoke about all of these new IoT kind of options out there. So like uh, John Deere building these new connected tractors and you know, agricultural, I, I'm going to say tractors as a service kind of, yeah. it's like farms as a service. Um, and all of that's being built on their own on-premise cloud things. And so all of these new services. On, on Deere's. On Deere's on-premise clouds, yes. So I'm like, on-premise agricultural field clouds, words. Um, so all of that's being built on their own cloud, and a lot of other companies like GE are building their own IoT services on their own clouds. And so all of these are new Greenfields opportunities, and they're being built on-prem on clouds that they're, they're hosting. And so 
there's going to be these legacy systems that no one's going to deal with. I mean, IBM's still in selling their mainframes, right? Then there's going to be these like fun testing and QA and weird workloads that you're like, send them to Amazon, send them, I don't know, maybe to Google, since you know maybe Google's going to get into the enterprise a little more seriously, or Microsoft. Um, and then there's going to be the things that you know you just leave on prem because they work. And maybe those won't even be on a cloud. Who so, knows? but th that's it's interesting that you mentioned the Internet of Things apps as greenfield apps because we don't have anything that they're replacing. But to think of them as um, that their first or natural home might be on the on the vendor's premises, yeah. on on the the enterprise's premises. Have you gotten in any insight as to why that might be? Because of their data, some of that is just so precious to the company that, that has it, or maybe it's like a hospital or medical data, or like, from, sorry, from a medical device. So like, yeah. if you're Johnson & Johnson and you're selling some sort of connected medical device, you want to keep that data as secure as possible because, my God, if something goes awry and you're like, insulin pump starts shooting out sugar into somebody's like, I don't know what you shoot insulin into. I'm well, like, like your body and your glycemic index goes yes, off. Yes, that, that's yeah. terrible. That's bad. Um, <laughs> you, you really want to lock that down. Um, so that's that's one example. And the other is because, you know, this is this is precious. One day you might be able to sell it to somebody else and, and you don't want that in Amazon if you can help it. So what about the concept of data gravity um, or, or someone told us the other day, data mass. Like data isn't Have you drawing been the planets. Have talking to Dave McCrory? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, we give him credit. But th the notion that you know, if you've got information coming in from all sorts of devices everywhere, it might more easily come into data centers that are publicly managed because they're more strategically placed, and that they have the the cabling, the optical cabling mm -hmm. for low latency, you know, replication or messaging if need be. And so it almost, that, m that infrastructure might lend itself to Internet of Things apps. I have no idea how to respond to that because I still am a big fan of like the problems of bandwidth and we haven't, we haven't gotten around that. But a lot of the, a lot of the data that we're talking about with the Internet of Things is, is smaller. It's it's time series. It's you send it someplace. You do the processing there. You handle it, and you've got a. I'm like I don't know what this is called. This this thing that's happening with my fist. But you've got a decision that's made, and right. then you you send it out. Right. Um, so with that, the concept of data gravity doesn't really necessarily have to apply as much. Um, and I, I just don't think, like in an ideal world, that would be the case. But in a, the way the business models are evolving, it is appearing to be very much like, I keep my data, I'll let you have access to some of it and through some sort of kind of data exchange. The challenge is we still don't have those business models yet. So I think we're kind of at a place where we're like, hmm, maybe we have a magical data lake, but Everyone I'm talking to in like the IoT world is like, the problem with data lakes is nobody can grab anything out of it when they want it in it's time. It's curated, yeah. So they hate that, and that's what I think of when we think of kind of data gravity. And the problem with data exchanges is nobody has a business model yet that makes it really work. So it's really kind of this data mess, and so I don't, I don't really know the answer. Okay, so that's interesting. The takeaway is that we're kind of in between generations between, you know, um, sort of distributed applications and the new era of Internet of Things applications. Well, those are, I mean, I still think those are distributed. Yes, <laughs> but, they, they are, but they are characterized by um, capturing and processing much more data towards the origin of right, that at data. Right, at the edge. At the edge. Um, so what are some of the things that, that surprised you about what you saw here, or maybe perhaps disappointed you that you didn't see more of? I would have loved to talk more about this, but. We have a conference. I was like, we have a conference hopefully in June that we're going to do a little bit of this at, because this is something I'm really excited about and kind of figuring out architectures for this exact problem, because it's, 
It's data synchronization, like how do you deal with that? It's got bandwidth problems. It's figuring out like how do you move software and processing like around at the edge? Because sometimes you're going to want it at the edge, sometimes you're going to want it at the core, and it, it may differ. So. so would the sweet spot of the applications that we're dealing with now and the infrastructure be the software defined data center, the you know, the sort of terminology that we were driving towards I don't eight think years so. ago. I, no? I, so the software defined Not data. for IoT, but for structure. So for structure? I don't know. I mean the, so the software defined data center I feel like maybe the data center is everywhere. I feel like that's probably a better way to start thinking about it. That's interesting. The infrastructure is everywhere. And, and how do you build for that? Okay. So in other words the construct of four walls and a bunch of guard dogs, you know, that's a little too physical. Now what we've got is sort of something virtualized and the distance between the elements is what we don't have to worry about. It's spreading. So Okay, that's interesting. Um, but yeah. But I'm just kind of a crazy crazy person out here, so who knows? Well that's why we want to talk to you. Not the crazy part, but the vision part. The maybe, out there part. Maybe they two, the two go together. All right. Um, so, so if you look back a couple years and then take that as a, you know, connect the dots and look out a couple years, what do you think at Structure we'll be talking about, you know, a couple years in the future? Oh, man. This is the kind of question I ask people, and, I, and I'm always waiting for their answer, and I never want to think about it on my own. Um, I think security, we've got to figure out. Um, I think machine learning is going to be a big topic. I'm really interested to think about what kind of hardware, how we kind of build data centers around that. I've been waiting for years for ARM to be invading the data center. I'm still waiting, so I don't know how we're going to, what we're going to see on that front. So, and you know, I'd kind of like someone to take Intel down a peg just in terms of the monolithic processor. You know, they've got 96% of the the market in servers. That's a lot. I heard a um, statistic that was kind of interesting that if you, uh, once we get to the 10 nanometer geometry mm -hmm. for transistor size, um, all the transistors that we will need for all the data centers in the world will be produced in one fab or m the capacity of one fab. And the rest is memory. Any, any thoughts on, on what that might mean for what the data centers and Intel look like? That's a crazy stat. Is that just for servers? Um, I mean, because... Basically, yes. Okay, because, I mean, we'll still need chips for everything else. Yes. So, um, but less and less Intel chips. Right. Well, that's why Intel's gotten into the fabrication business, or, like, fabbing other people's chips. So I would imagine we'll see more aggression from them in making other people's chips because that does make sense. Right. Um, so that's, that would be my thoughts on that is, ooh, they better, they better start signing up some more customers. Have you thought about systems management and, you know, as, the, as we disassociate the physical boundaries of a data center from sort of the capabilities of a data center, what does it mean to, to manage that infrastructure? Oh. Um, that wasn't meant to stump you. It's no, just no. <laughs> I'm like, oh, George. Um, I don't think a lot about systems management outside of IoT. So I do think about it in terms of managing like sensors. Yeah. So t okay. So I, I I think about like, God, ILM on sensors and like deploying any ILM sort of ILM being the information, information lifecycle life management, management. So. but not really information lifecycle management, um, but not technically that, but when you do updates on sensors, you know, how can you roll that back? Because right now, there is no management for, if you have a massive array of sensors in a, in a factory, for example, if you update all of them and it breaks something, you really can't control that right now. Right. And so getting some sort of orchestration layer on top of that is really important. Um, so I think about those kind of things, but I don't think about it really for the data center right now. Okay, all right. Stacy, as always, fun to talk to you and, and have you on. Very insightful. We'll have to leave it there. Um, this is George Gilbert, and we are at the Julia Morgan Ballroom in downtown San Francisco. 
at the Structure 15 conference, and we'll be back in a moment.